This lecture will focus on the geometric and structural features of the Catalano house. The Catalano house was built in 1954 in Raleigh, North Carolina by Eduardo Catalano, a young Argentinian architect who was one of the first faculty members to join the newly formed North Carolina State University School of Design. The house was publicized as the House of the Decade by House and Home magazine in the 1950s. It became an icon of American mid-century optimism. The house simultaneously met two seemingly contradictory design goals, those being providing a wonderful sense of shelter with a broad expanse of roof with ample overhangs and providing a wonderful sense of connection to nature with glass walls all around and the upward sweep of the roof opening up expansive views of the surrounding forest. The overarching roof swept up over the interior landscaping to create a unified free-flowing space. The roof form was perfect for crafting and expressing space in one direction, the arched form came down to sturdy buttresses, compacting space and creating a sense of security and power. In the other direction, space took off and soared, leading the eye into the great outdoors. This shows one of the buttresses, in this case the buttress on the high side of the site. The other buttress is on the other side here. On the lower side of the site, the buttress is elevated up on a concrete wall to keep the structure level. This close-up view also shows the threaded ends of the tension elements which tie the two buttresses on the opposite sides of the building together. A column on each side keeps the shell from tipping over under wind load or asymmetric gravity load on the roof. This is an interior photograph taken during construction. The shell had three layers of three quarter inch thick tongue and groove wood forming a sandwich with an overall thickness of two and a quarter inches. This image shows the bottom layer of wood which was installed face down with the finished surface of the material forming the ceiling surface. This material arched from buttress to buttress along these curves. The next layer up was oriented perpendicular to the bottom layer and was curved in the other direction, draping from high point to high point. The top layer followed the pattern of the bottom layer going in this arch shape from buttress to buttress. All these boards meet the boundary at 45 degrees. The material shown in the bottom layer was hard of fur, straight grained with minimal knots. The two layers above were knotty pine, which was much lower grade, having softer, wider grain, more crossing grain, larger knots, or I should say large knots, and possibly shorter members with more breaks in the boards. These knots and breaks in the boards are a serious concern in any situation where the boards are subjected to tension force, since there is no continuity for transmitting the force. The layers were nailed with no glue. The house was embedded in the forest, surrounded by trees with no other building in sight. The walls were all glass. Even with the leaves off the trees, there was a sense of privacy provided by the expanse of the forest. The area under the overhang became the outdoor living and dining space. The roof was in a form of a hyperbolic paraboloid, which can be under, under which can be generated 
starting with two parabolas. So here we have a parabola that's in an arch shape and a parabola that's in a draped shape. We can take this parabola and without changing its shape or its vertical plane, we can sweep it through space along this parabola, which gives us this family of curves. Then we can take this parabola and sweep it along the draped parabola to produce the final shape. This is an example of a structural configuration based on the hyperbolic paraboloid. Each arched element is acting as a properly buttressed arch. So each of these elements comes down. There is a major strut here that delivers that load to the foundation. And you'll notice tie members connecting one side to the other. So we end up effectively with a tied arch in every one of these arched elements. The curvature of the structure in the other direction, which is this way, gives depth to the structure, inhibiting buckling of the arches and also resisting asymmetric loads such as drifting snow load or wind load from left or right. We can test our hypothesis that adding double curvature stiffens and strengthens the vault relative to roll-through deformation. This image shows a simple barrel vault here with curvature in one direction and its flat or straight lines in the other. Here we have the hyperbolic paraboloid with curved arched elements and then a curvature in the opposite direction. Um, producing the hyperbolic paraboloid. This image shows the deformations under asymmetric no, snow load, which were, which are in this case exaggerated for visualization purposes, although they're not dramatically exaggerated because you'll notice in the case of this simple barrel vault, we're ending up with 25 inches of deformation for the particular study we did. In this case, for the hyperbolic paraboloid, at the same scale, there is no detectable deformation. This is a hyperbolic paraboloid based on the parabola that was used in generating the form of the Catalano house. This is what it looks like rendered with the wood boards. Uh, in this case, the buttresses, the buttressing elements have been masked out because we want to focus on what's happening in the wood shell. Under full factored gravity load, which is 1.2 times the dead load plus 1.6 times the snow load, the axial stresses are quite uniform along the arches, and they're quite consistent from arch to arch. And I want to point out here a certain graphic technique. There are little yellow flags on the tops of the members. The fact that they're on top is graphically indication is a graphic indication of it, the fact that it's compression. In this case, also the yellow color of the flags was chosen for compression. So whenever you see yellow flags, they'll be on top of the members and the yellow will be indicative of the fact that it's compression. Um, if we take a close-up look of that, the axial stresses under full factor gravity load um, in compression are 0.336 KSI, which is substantially less than the design compression stress for the wood. These compression stresses constitute the only significant structural action in this particular structure. It turns out that the tension stress is negligible, as is the bending action. This is what we think of as a structurally pure concept in that it is working totally by axial forces with no bending action to reduce the efficiency.
This shows the deflection under dead load plus snow load, which is only 0.282 inches. Um, in this case, it had to be exaggerated for us to even see it. And you'll notice here it's barely detectable graphically. By any reasonable standard, this is an extremely rigid structure under this particular load. So why not use this form? Um, and I guess the answer is that there tend to be some low dark spaces here and here. It feels a bit like a tunnel and it's kind of boring. So we can think of ways to make it more interesting, one of which is to reduce some of the material where it tends to be low and dark. So for example, we could retain a buttressing element here and a buttressing element there and cut away the corners here. Um, in a sense, we'll be producing a, an arch or a vault which starts like a normal arch in a very confined buttressing area and flares outward and upward and then goes back down again to the other buttress. So to describe how this works, we'll start with a wireframe. We'll select the members that we want to delete. And once they're deleted, we end up with a structure that looks like this. And we discover that it is structurally incomplete since all of these compression members, which were working before just fine in compression, have now been terminated and there is nothing there to provide a buttressing force. We can add edge members along here and there and here and there. And we hope that those will provide the required buttressing force. When we analyze this structure, we discover that there is significant compression force in all the arched elements. These elements going this way. And this force is shown in yellow flags. These compression forces are quite uniform along the members and they're uniform from member to member. In other words, they're very, very similar up here to what they are down here. There is also significant tension force in the draped boards. And the tension forces are expressed with cyan flags, which are below the members. So everywhere you see yellow, you see compression force. Everywhere you see these cyan colored flags, they represent tension forces. The tension forces are relatively uniform along the members and from member to member. So the, they are similar to here to what they are there. So we still have what we call a pure structural concept in that it is working in pure axial compression and tension with no significant bending action to reduce the efficiency of the structure. We can zoom in on that image and we see that at the edge, the compression force in one of these arched members, which is shown with this yellow flag, is equal in magnitude to the tension force in this draped board as represented by these cyan flags. At the edge, the perpendicular outward force of the compression board is equal in magnitude to the inward pull of the tension board. In other words, the perpendicular component of this correct compression force balances the perpendicular component of this tension force and they produce a net compression force along the length of the member. Because when you look at this point, you see this compression member is tending to push downward on the edge. And this tension member is tending to pull downward on the edge. Which is why in this zone or this segment of the edge piece, 
we have flags that are this high representing that much compression. When we pass over this point, we have a discontinuity where we're throwing additional compression force into the edge. So this is exactly how we want the edge to behave, which is as a pure compression member with no bending. At this point, we have the following concerns. There is twice as much cross-section in the boards that are arched as in the boards that are in tension because there are two layers of material that are acting in compression. Our second concern is that wood is not as good in tension as in compression, particularly for wood with discontinuity and big knots. There are other breakdowns in this chain of tension force transfer, such as the bolts at the boundary, as shown in this image. So here, here you have a series of boards. They come to the edge and you'll notice the means of connection is a series of fairly widely spaced bolts. Some tension boards are not even engaged at all with these bolts, but worse yet, the bolts are only engaged with about 5 to 10% of the wood cross-sectional area, which will cause severe bearing stress in the holes of the wood and an extreme tendency to tear out the weak end grain of the wood. This is a good time to set aside our 21st century computational methods and think about what was actually known in mid 20th century. What we knew at that time was that uniformly distributed load induces uniform and acceptable stress levels in the hyperbolic paraboloid shell if it is constructed from a homogeneous isotropic material that works well under either tension stress or compression stress. We knew this from calculus and not from computers. We had absolutely beautiful calculus solutions that explained with great precision and elegance this aspect of the structural behavior. So the question is, what didn't we know at mid-century? We didn't know how to account for inhomogeneity in the material, such as grain, which makes the material anisotropic, and in the case of this building, alternate grain direction between various layers. We didn't have a way of accounting for the lack of force transfer at discontinuities in the tension boards, knots fracturing, nails bending, bolts bending, damaging damage to the wood occurring at the bolts and so forth. We also did not know how to calculate stresses induced by non-uniform loads such as self-weight, which is extreme, extremely non-uniform when we account for the heavy steel edge members. We also did not know how to calculate deflection for this particular shape under any load conditions. And we did not know how to account for thin shell buckling. Many experimental thin shell structures in the 50s and 60s failed by buckling because we did not have a good buckling theory to account for those effects. So a huge question is what motivated Eduardo Catalano to risk his family house and his reputation on an endeavor with so many unknowns? And I think the answers in some ways are very simple. One is he was compelled by the spatial beauty of this particular form. And I think he was also inspired by the mathematical elegance. The theories that we had that described this particular form under uniform load were really quite beautiful and quite compelling.
So we'll return to our modern computational methods for a moment and explore some of the things that were not known in the mid 20th century. This image shows the deformation under uniform snow load. It's been slightly exaggerated here. Uh, the worst deformation occurs up at the tips here, and it's about an inch and a half. And just as we discovered, there was no insurmountable stress associated with this particular shape under uniform load. Um, the evidence is that there are not serious deflection problems either. However, if we switch to the self-weight of the structure, uh, our feelings change abruptly. The deflection under self-weight is about 21 inches, which is somewhat exaggerated here, but not a great deal. This is a horrifying result. And we have good reason to believe it is actually worse than the simulate simulation indicates because nowhere in the simulation have we accounted for discontinuity in the tension boards, not failure, nails bending, bolts bending, and tearing out of end grain. This deformation gives us a deep concern, particularly because if the shell moves too much, the columns, which are very stiff, will not tolerate the movement and they will tend to poke up through the thin shell. As part of this simulation, I examined the bending stress in the shell immediately above the column and it was several times greater than any of the axial stresses based on the thin shell spanning action, which would occur freely without the columns underneath it. The shell was constructed on top of straight beams aligned with the geometric directrices. Notice how the beams gradually change slope from this slope at one end to that slope at the other, which is how the shape was generated. So the question is, what really happened? So the story I'm going to tell you went from Eduardo Catalano to Bob Burns to Thomas Howard to me and finally to you. And while I think all the people in this chain of information are very serious people who try to transfer things as accurately as possible, um, we all remember the game of telephone from kindergarten. So you should beware about potential errors. But this is the story as I remember it. When Eduardo Catalano started pulling out the formwork, the structure exhibited deeply disturbing deformations. Eduardo jammed the supports back under the shell and got on the phone to talk to his engineer in Argentina. Based on that conversation, the decision was made to add extra steel to the edges on the top and bottom to make them more beam-like and to add a tension cable from tip to tip to hold up the high end of the steel edge beams so that the steel edge beams could begin to support the edges of the wood shell. I did many structural simulations to try to understand the possible effects of these measures. The good news is that according to the simulations, the combination of proper steel, of a proper steel edge beam, and proper tensioning of the cable would eliminate all of the tendency of the columns to punch through the wood shell, at least under the self weight of the structure. In other words, the combination of edge beams and connecting cable was an excellent intuitive solution. However, it is not clear the degree to which the top and bottom steel of this beam was working together in composite action, nor is it clear to what degree this cable was tensioned. 
In the early days of the structure, there do not seem to be any significant indications that the columns are damaging the shell. A few years later, the deformation induced by the columns is becoming apparent. And as time went on, the punching deformation became more and more severe. So here you see that corner column pretty dramatically deforming the original shape of the structure. We don't know how much of that is due to lack of composite action in this beam and how much of it is due to the fact that the cable may not have been optimally tensioned. There are other issues that we need to touch on. This photo shows the edge of the shell towards the end of the life of the structure. Notice the water damage in the wood, which was most severe near the edge of the shell and diminished gradually with increasing distance from the edge. This is a sample of material from the edge of the shell towards the end of the life of the building. This is the edge. Here we have two layers that represent the top and bottom. And then at 90 degrees to that is the middle layer. And I want you to notice this large knot in that middle layer. This sketch of the edge detail, which was drawn by Thomas Howard, indicates the source of the water damage. Blowing rain would get caught behind this trim piece that was nailed to the edge of the wood shell. Water would wick down behind the trim piece and into the end grain of the wood shell. The deterioration was most severe at the line of bolts, which was somewhere along here. The bolts passing through the edge of the shell, where the combination of water damage and stress induced by the bolts accelerated the deterioration. Adding a large knot at that, this particular location made it inevitable that this chunk of material would be one of the first to separate. The final structural action was probably very little attributable to thin shell spanning action. It was probably more like a curved wood shell that was flexible enough that it would settle on anything beneath that would help to support it. Those supports would include the four edge beams, the two columns, and every vertical mullion in the glazing system. So when I examined the structure late in life, there appeared to be a crease along here, which represented the effect of all the other vertical mullions and not just these columns at the ends of the structure. The structure held up for a quarter of a century and would have gone longer if the water damage had not been a factor. It would have been interesting to see how the structure would have performed if it had lasted long enough to be subjected to the 22 inch snow that occurred late in the 1990s. This shows some of the damage caused by the punching action of the columns that are supporting the shell. You see the shell beginning to be to split apart uh, due to the action of the column. Most telling is this separation of the boards on the bottom layer of the wood, which makes it clear that the tension wood in the middle layer has given up. So the question is, what does it all mean? And I can't resist taking a, an opportunity to make a personal comment. I believe that this entire design and construction process has been in the tradition of great human exploration. Beauty can inspire us to take a great running leap into the unknown 
When we do that, we have to be prepared for what we might encounter. And the advice is, when everything appears to be falling apart, keep your wits about you. Because Eduardo Catalano kept his wits about him, his building stood long enough to catapult him into international recognition and to inspire a generation of designers. He went on to have a distinguished career as an architectural designer and an academic at a distinguished university. And, oh yes, his family did have a roof over their heads. That ends this presentation on the Catalano House in Raleigh, North Carolina.